the, the fiscals think that that is worthy of the GP court. What's the seriousness of cases that are going into the stipendiary magistrates court? We are known not. It's the number and the percentage of those serious cases in, in, in the stipendiary court that's important, and the figures seem to show that those that can, I would, on balance, relate to the sheriff court, it's relatively small. It's not 100 per cent, for instance. The, uh, these statistics were produced retrospectively after all these proposals were made. As I say, there was no consultation with the fiscal about any of this up until yesterday, as I understand it. The statistics actually say, in the pre in the these come from the executive note, and in the preceding paragraph it accepts that it gives no indication at all about how serious a case is. No, no indication at all. So they, they are bare statistics which have no scientific benefit and have been produced to try and, uh, and produce a cohesive argument, which, with respect, I think, has been totally contradicted by what the Procurator Fiscal has said. Mr Clancy, so, any comment on this? Do, uh, just um, that's what I'm going to bring in Stuart Maxwell now. Very briefly, please. Yeah. Well, I have to trust the statistics, and uh, statistics have to be developed retrospectively. They can't be developed prospectively. Um, uh, so it's important that uh, we, we acknowledge uh, that the government is acting in good faith here in producing this information in the executive note, uh, and if there is a criticism of the government's statistic gathering, uh, then uh, that's, that's another matter. But uh, just because uh, the government did not speak to the Procurator Fiscal in Glasgow before producing these statistics is not a good ground for saying that the statistics are wrong. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Stuart Maxwell. Thank you, Convener. Um, you can I just take you to the evidence supplied by the Law Society where on page 3 of their um, submission they provide a, a statement which says the, stip the stipendiary magistrate's court is therefore not the direct equivalent of the sheriff court, although the current fixed payment structure under the Criminal Legal Aid Fixed Payment Scotland Regulations 1989 is the same for both courts. Above that they list a whole lot of different types of um, uh, offences and uh, areas of the law which would not appear uh, in the stip court. And can I follow that up by, you, you certainly laid a lot of emphasis on the evidence of the letter from Leslie Thompson, the Procurator Fiscal. Um, given your um, case resting heavily on the comments in this letter, would you accept this, the sentence in the letter in the final paragraph which states, we generally prosecute the more sensitive or complex cases that are appropriate for summary proceedings in Glasgow Sheriff Court? Uh, and then it goes on to talk about cases which, of course, would only go in the Sheriff Court, wouldn't go to the Stip Court. Um, given the fact that um, I think both the Lost Science Evidence and the letter that you've, you've mentioned a number of times this morning, it states that the more complex and sensitive cases go to the Sheriff Court and not the Stip Court, do you accept there is, in fact, a difference between the, the cases that are going, in general terms, although there's an overlap, in general terms, there's a difference between the cases that are going to the Sheriff Court and are going to the Stip Court? I can firstly deal with the Law Society's submission. And they, they have given a list of uh, a number of different cases that they say do not appear in the Stip Court. Um, again, it highlights the complete misunderstanding that the Law Society have about the role of the Stip Court. The breaches of community service do not fall under the fixed fee that we are dealing with in these regulations. The same applies to probation orders. They do not come under the consideration of these particular regulations. Uh, they say fraud. As I've already highlighted, there are three benefit frauds in Appendix B alone, um, which is one day's business. Um, there is a sexual aggravation in one of the cases in Appendix B. Um, so there are a number of uh, complex matters. The other thing to bear in mind is that even if one regards what the fiscal says as sensitive and complex, because a matter, say, let's use the domestic abuse court, um, they invariably have a low number of witnesses in these cases. There's normally the complainer and, and a couple of police officers, perhaps a second witness. So even if one regards those cases as more sensitive, there is still the same amount of work required in the stipendiary magistrate's court to deal with a case. Similarly, if you have a racial aggravation, it's still a breach of the peace, and the work we will require to do will still require the same level of work as a racial breach of the peace or a sectarian breach of the peace. So even if, if the sensitive side of things is, is accepted, and I do accept that to some extent, it still doesn't really take into account the, the level of work that's put in by the solicitor in, in our submission, it's the same amount of work in each case. Well, I accept your point on sensitivity. Um, you haven't mentioned complexity. 
the, as I say, I've already indicated the benefit fraud. There was three benefit frauds in one day's business of 25. Uh, so three out of 25 cases in the stipendiary court on the 3rd of uh, March. These are complex cases, and as I understand it, the, the fiscal has recently moved those cases into the stipendiary magistrate's court because of pressure of business. And the other thing to bear in mind is that any time a fiscal could take a batch of certain types of cases and move it into the stipendiary magistrate's court, at any time, if there's pressure of business at the Sheriff Court, she has the power to do so because the Criminal Procedure Act basically makes those two courts of the same status. Uh, and that not only, again, these statistics don't bear in mind that at any time the fiscal could simply take a certain type of case and move it into the other court. So I'm, a, I'm a clear in my, my understanding that you don't accept that uh, more complex cases go to the Sheriff Court in general terms. I know there's you know, an overlap here, and we can all point to individual cases that you know, can, in a sense, break the rule. But in general terms, they are prosecuted more complex cases in the Sheriff Court rather than the Step Court. Can I perhaps intervene and take you back to what, what we said a moment or two ago? It, it must be appreciated that when you're talking about complex cases, you're talking about cases within the Glasgow jurisdiction, which is the biggest, busiest, complex jurisdiction there is, not only in Scotland, but within the whole of the United Kingdom. Now, complex cases, if, if one has to take a decision whether to put the most complex case into the Sheriff Court or the Stipendary Magistrates Court, I think what would happen is that the, the most complex case would go to the Sheriff Court. That does not mean, however, that the cases which are being placed before the Stipendary Magistrates Court in Glasgow would not be regarded as being complex in any other Sheriff jurisdiction. The Glasgow jurisdiction is different. That is why it has at least four Stipendary Magistrates Courts running every day at least three or four Justice of the Peace Courts running every day, and also the full plethora of Sheriff Court cases running every day. It's a different jurisdiction. I am what you are saying, but I don't accept that big, and, or, big or busy means uh, complex. Uh, big or busy means big or busy. It just means there is more. It doesn't necessarily mean complex. But if I could just move on, because I know, Kavira, we are short time. Of time. So, very, very briefly. I would, well, I would appreciate an answer from the Law Society in this area, given their comments on it. But secondly, just on the consultation question that you raised earlier, about the lack of consultation, I think, is to summarise what your position was. Um, again, in the Law Society evidence, it clearly states that uh, the Society's position was communicated to the Cabinet Secretary of Justice as agreed by representatives of the local faculties on 6 January. That meeting included representatives from 19 faculties across Scotland, including Glasgow. Um, you have made a counter-proposal in your evidence, uh, your written submission. Um, how much consultation have you met put into that across Scotland? In relation to the five pounds, in relation to the five that, pounds. it was put to the, the Law Society and the negotiating team on a number of occasions by a number of different individuals. I put it forward at the Law Society Council meeting, um, and a, a, it was rejected. And, and I'll tell you why it was rejected. It was rejected because. All the other faculties were given the option, you can sacrifice Glasgow and they take a larger hit in the cut in their stipendiary magistrate fee, or if you don't agree to that, then you will be less worse off because you will take uh, there will be a further cut in relation to your core fee. Uh, and it's significant that the vote was 18 to 1, Glasgow obviously being the one. But for the others to vote against that would have meant that they themselves would have suffered financially as a result. This is what the, the GBA's obse uh, objection to the Law Society has been throughout this. It, it necessitated self-interest, and there was self-interest in those who voted to make Glasgow take a bigger hit in this. And that effectively was why, uh, as a result of this, I resigned from the Law Society Council, because this had been done. Okay, I, I would like to, I think we need an answer from the Law Society on this point about that, that particular issue. But you do seem to be suggesting that your colleagues right across Scotland are extremely mercenary for the sake of five pounds. But I'll pass on that and then we'll move on to the Law Society. I think um, it's important to realise that the Society represents all the solicitors in Scotland, uh, including uh, solicitors in Glasgow. Uh, the Society uh, operates on uh, issues of principle. The principles involved in this were to maintain access to justice, to ensure that solicitors got a fair remuneration for work done and to get a, a generally a fair treatment in terms of swinging government cuts at 8 per cent 
on the legal aid budget. So it's important for us to appreciate the context when the original proposal to increase the Public Defence Solicitor's Office uh, to 41 solicitors and four additional offices was uh, mooted by the government uh, in uh, the latter part of last year. Uh, that would have had an impact right across the country, including Glasgow. The so society was put in a difficult position to negotiate a difficult uh, set of arrangements, uh, and that has resulted in the regulations before you this morning. Uh, Andrew has some uh, specific comments on uh, the paragraph relating to uh, the, the various offences, don't you? Uh, yes, indeed, but I'd also like to say of that faculty meeting uh, that, uh, yes, I mean, you know, sort of obviously the stipendiary court, you know, sort of uh, is a different issue and one unique to Glasgow, but equally there are faculties who are represented at that meeting from across Scotland that would be affected by the various measures that these, that these regulations represent. For instance, uh, through the PDSO expansion, there will be people who are from West Lothian. They will see the PDSO taking a 35% share of their GT scheme for the first time ever. There are colleagues from the Scottish borders who would have benefited from a full-scale expansion of the PDSO taking place because the PDSO office wouldn't have opened in their area, but instead took a cut to their core fee. Um, there are colleagues, you know, sort of in uh, rural areas of Scotland who these packages are going to uh, affect through, for instance, the cuts to travel. So I think that it is uh, an exceptionally difficult job. An 8.2% cut is going to affect criminal legal aid lawyers across Scotland. Uh, and I think that that was something which was reflected on maturely at this faculties meeting. In terms of the, um, it, the figures regarding the seriousness of offences, the information that we've received relates to cases paid by the Scottish Legal Aid Board. That obviously has a small margin of error there because uh, not every case is publicly funded. But looking at, say, for instance, cases such as, uh, as, as uh, David O'Hagan mentioned, uh, fraud, um, Fraud cases uh, before the stipendiary court uh, amount to around uh, 25 per year. Um, in terms of the sheriff court, they amount to about 130 per year. This bearing in mind, according to Crown Office figures, is uh, on the basis of summary matters going before the sheriff court, being roughly on a two-to-one proportion between the uh, sheriff court and the stipendiary magistrate. Thank you. Um, I'm very, very short time. Time for two more questions. Um, Bill Butler and James Kelly. Thanks, convener. As long as it's a two-part question, yep. that's fine. Okay, correct. Uh, if I'm quick, thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to, as it's becoming a habit of quoting Leslie Thompson, um, let me quote um, the um, following, or the, the sentence that follows the sentence quoted by my colleague Stuart Maxwell, and it goes like this. While the cases that are prosecuted in Glasgow Stipendiary Magistrates Court will not include any of the foregoing, I can confirm that the other types of cases in the stip courts are all of a sheriff court level. Um, Mr O'Hagan, do you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Mr Alexander and Mr Clancy, do you disagree with that or do you question the veracity of that statement, yes or no? Uh, no. Although there Thank is you. That's okay. Well, uh, uh, well, well uh, you know, well, those were my questions with the well, greatest yes, of respect. Right. But it's a matter for the witness, surely, to provide a full answer. It's a matter for the convener. Um, I'm going to ask Mr. Uh, Mr. Alexander, do you have anything further to add in response um, to Mr. Butler's question? Yes. Thank you very much for the, the opportunity to do so. I'll be very brief indeed. Uh, we are at a stage at the moment where the number of summary matters going before uh, the Scottish courts has been uh, reducing quite substantially. Uh, from uh, 77,963 in 2005-2006 to 49,298 in 2009-10. Uh, during that period, uh, we have, or during a shorter period, we've seen the district court increase from, in 2007, 5,000 uh, odd cases to uh, 8,000 odd cases at uh, what's now the Justice of the Peace Court. So there's a, a clear, uh, you know, sort of uh, message there, which is that uh, at a time at which direct measures have been uh, removing some of the least serious cases out of the criminal justice system, the amount of cases going, for instance, to the Justice of the Peace Court has been increasing substantially, and the stip court you know, sort of, uh, business has remained roughly the same as well. So I think that there is probably, on a sort of more gradual perspective, uh, possibly an indication that there are more serious, courts, more serious cases being dealt with in lower courts. That's really a matter of opinion, now. and I, I much prefer the matter of fact that you answered. So thank you very much for that, and thank you, convener, because I don't need any advice from any other colleagues as to the questions I ask, okay. and I thank you for your protection. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Kelly. Yeah, thanks a lot. Well, I want to return to the question I posed to the Law Society earlier about the alternative proposal for the Glasgow Bar Association, because I wasn't satisfied with the answer. 
Um, the, the, the proposal is that the reduction in fa of five pounds to the core fee for all legal aid grants would derive the same amount of savings uh, as has been proposed by the reduction in the core fee for the stipendiary to magistrates court and I asked uh, uh, does the law society agree that those figures are accurate and if uh, you don't accept those figures what's your alternative figure to derive the same amount of savings um, the fact of the matter is that we proposed a package of savings uh, to uh, get the equivalent uh, uh, of the government's original anticipated uh, saving of 4.25 million uh, and so therefore uh, it has to be taken in the round it may be the case that the five pound cut would be an equivalent uh, for the uh, uh, 380,000 pounds in this year uh, and the 600,000 next year but as part of the package uh, one has to understand that, uh, the, the approach that the society has been taking and it is on the basis of the package uh, that we promoted uh, these changes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, gentlemen on the panel, thank you for your time this morning. I think all the points have been exhausted, but is there anything further you would like to add very, very briefly? If I could, uh, Chairman. Myself and Mr Hagan are somewhat different from the chaps coming from the Law Society of Scotland. There has been an over-focus on statistics. I don't deal with an industrial process. I deal with human beings and all of the complexities and all of the vulnerabilities. Whether those human beings be complainers or whether those uh, vulnerable persons and human beings be accused persons, they have to be dealt with as individuals. And simply looking at what a charge is on a case does not give you the complexity of that case does not give you the complexity of the individuals in that case and their vulnerabilities and protections that are required in order to properly provide a defence to that individual. And it's very easy to get lost in statistics and lose sight of the individuals that those statistics are meant to serve. Can, can, sorry, can I just add um, to Mr Sweeney's comments in relation that what we don't want this to be about is simply what solicitors are being paid. There is a public element here, and what has concerned the GBA from the outset is that the Law Society have failed to properly take into account the public interest. I say that for two reasons. One, they did not consult. The negotiating team did not at any time consult with the Access to Justice Committee of the Law Society. And secondly, when at a council meeting the negotiating team were challenged about the potential Article 6 contraventions with what they were proposing, the vice convener at that point said that if the solicitors were successful it would be a hollow victory because they would simply have cuts made elsewhere. So in our view, the public interest is not being properly taken into account, particularly the citizens of Glasgow. Okay. Thank you. Does the Law Society wish to add anything? No, uh, the Society has a statutory obligation to promote the interests of the solicitor's profession and the interests of the public in relation to that profession. Of course we have the public interest at heart uh, when uh, thinking of access to justice issues. The, uh, the internal management of our committees is another matter, uh, but uh, the, the fact of the matter is that, as you'll have seen from our submission, uh, the three principles to which we apply uh, in uh, these regulations where access to justice, uh, f uh, proper remuneration for the work done, uh, and overall fairness within the savings package. Um, I, I think it's, it's, um, it's unfortunate uh, to suggest that, that the society does not have uh, access to justice concerns at its heart. Uh, I remember uh, from the very earliest days of being involved with uh, legal aid issues, um, uh, traversing arguments about Article 6 uh, in order to protect and preserve uh, advice and assistance in Scotland in 1992-93. Uh, so uh, that is a long heritage uh, for, for us to reflect upon uh, and it, I cannot accept uh, that we have not borne that in mind in dealing with these regulations. Uh, the, the issue of consultation is something of course uh, where uh, we can always do better, uh, but uh, within the time screens concerned uh, over the, uh, the process from the publication of the Scottish Government budget to the present day, we have given as much effort as we possibly could to consultation with relevant interests. 
uh, and we uh, certainly bore in mind uh, the fact that uh, 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 Mr. Sweeney indicates that he deals with people. We deal with people too. We deal with people who are solicitors. We deal with people who are solicitors' clients, uh, and we accept that they are complex and human individuals just as much as we are. And we're not just statistical uh, uh, policy wonks. Okay. Um, thank you all for your time this morning. Um, I'm now going to suspend briefly to allow the table to the panel to change. I think we will reconvene. Um, I'd like to welcome the Cabinet Secretary for Justice again. Apologies, Cabinet Secretary, for the delay in, in bringing you forward. Um, I'd like to um, welcome you and your colleagues, uh, Mr. Colin Mackay, Deputy Director, Legal System Division, James Howe, Head of Access to Justice Team, and Fraser Gough, Scottish Government Legal Directorate. And I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a short opening statement. Thank you, Convener. My letter to the Committee in advance of this meeting makes clear the financial context in which we're operating in this savings that need to be made in legal aid in 2011-12. As the committee has heard this morning, making these savings has meant taking some very difficult decisions. Those decisions have not been taken lightly, but I've been clear that I have to take action now to ensure the long-term sustainability of the legal aid system and to preserve access to justice. Savings have been proposed in a number of areas, including on the Scottish Legal Aid Board's administration budget, on fees paid to solicitors for travel time, and on fees paid to counsel. But given that almost two-thirds of spend comes on the criminal side, it was always clear that savings would have to be made on summary criminal legal assistance. Decisions have been taken in close consultation with the Law Society of Scotland. I have personally had a series of meetings with the Society's criminal legal aid negotiating team. The Society had originally asked me to protect core fees. That was why, in November, I proposed a large expansion of the PDSO. Then the Society, at the start of December, requested further time to consult with the profession. They came back to me on 7 January with revised proposals for a lesser expansion of the PDSO and the reductions in summary fees we are looking at today. The Society wrote to me again on 4 February in relation to one aspect of the package of reductions, the reduction in the fee paid for work in the Stipendiary Magistrate Court. I had a further meeting with the Society to discuss this proposal and agreed to raise the proposed reduction from £350 to £390. That's £95 below the new summary core fee. I accept that stipendiary magistrates currently operate only in Glasgow due to the volume of business. I also accept